Good morning friends, we welcome you to live lectures. Today for this lecture, uh, we are going to discuss more on women and cinema. For this uh, lecture today with us we have Dr. Shruti Webb. Dr. Webb is Assistant Professor in Department of History in PGDAV uh, Evening College. Friends, if you want to ask any question, uh, you can contact us on our toll free number and let me give you our toll free number. It is 1-800-110-430. Let me repeat it again for you. 1-800-110-430. Let's welcome Dr. Shruti. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Uh, thanks for giving me an opportunity to continue uh, with the topic that we have been discussing for last uh, two lectures. Uh, well, the topic uh, is women and cinema as was just introduced by Disha. Now, continuing from where I had left in the last lecture, we were discussing the theories related to cinema and theories related to feminism. So, today I would be starting the discussion with a brief description of globalization and how theorization has continued with the globalization paradigm in the backdrop. Now, uh, one must take into account the post-globalization developments that have impacted cinema, the f art of filmmaking in a big way. Here, uh, one has to take into consideration as to whether there has been a change from portrayal of women in stereotype roles to portrayal of women in non-conventional roles or not. Also, whether the audience has become maturer or not. Also, what are the non-conventional themes that are being developed now by the filmmakers? Uh, at the same time, one has to take into consideration the whole issue of film finance, uh, the art of filmmaking, emergence of new techniques, and how the emergence of corporates uh, instead of studio system has impacted cinema. For example, after 2004, Yash Raj films emerged in a big way and movies like Veer Zara definitely left their mark and paved the way for future ventures. Uh, similarly, UTV banner also emerged in a big way. Uh, at the same time, one has to take into consideration the role of advertising, uh, particularly global advertising agencies, market uh, sales that are conducted round the clock, and also a uh, usage of stationery like CDs, books, merchandise, shows, etc. And basically a worldwide network that has been created in order to promote this new wave cinema, uh, particularly from the globalization period onwards, that is 1990s. Now coming to the issue of film finance, it would be interesting to know as to what are the changes that have come about. So definitely there have been structured film financing and institutional loans, bank loans which are uh, on the offer now uh, in addition to APO funds as well as venture capital. So all this pertaining to corporatization of film finance, something which was not really there before 1980s. Also, various media and entertainment companies raise money through IPOs and high net worth individuals and companies who were traditionally not really involved in the business of entertainment. Also, crowdfunding uh, has picked up and uh, people are seen as co-producers and co-investors as they also help in funding some films. Uh, you can give an example of Reliance Big Pictures in this context as most important Indian production company in Hollywood. It has made a mark for itself and also a number of production houses uh, in US are related to it. And in fact, 50% uh, of stake in DreamWorks Limited can be ascribed to this company. Uh, 
The company has acquired a number of cinema houses in areas that were inhabited by diaspora to show Indian films. So definitely the strategy is to market films abroad post 1990s and not only make films that pertain to Indian viewers. A uh, film distribution has also taken off in a big way and the cinema addresses not only the wealthy middle class but also NRIs because they it is they who bring a higher ticket price and a much higher value uh, can be earned from showing films abroad. Also various movies like Kabhi Khushi Kabhi Gum, Kuch Kuch Hota Hai belong to this genre and they were outright hits abroad, much more popular abroad than in India. Now coming to the impact of globalization and liberalization on cinema as well as on women which is our core uh, discussion today, uh, one has to talk about an increase in alternative sources of entertainment post 1990s. So with the opening up of Indian economy, there was also an opening up, up of the entertainment sector uh, with the coming in of internet, satellite television, uh, there were massive changes in the field of entertainment industry, music, uh, upcoming multiplexes in India, rising prices of tickets and achievement of far more revenues than was possible earlier. This also resulted in rising job prospects and catering to the tastes of an emerging middle class. But this also resulted in another kind of a journey and that was a journey of unending desires and also escapism because it was not possible always to fulfill all the desires that one had. So therefore, cinema began to be looked forward to as a way of escapism where middle class could spend three hours watching the beautiful locations of the world and enjoying the best kind of entertainment with item songs pitched in without bothering about the theme or the very core strategy that was being employed by the film makers. So in the era of globalization, new meanings have been attached to the dream world that has been portrayed by contemporary films and this uh, has created a kind of wonderland and this wonderland comprises exotic foreign locations, a display of expensive commodities, designer clothes, etc. So basically uh, providing everything on screen what one aspires for. Popular Bollywood films not only provide escapism by satisfying the viewer's ideological and material desires, but they also give them a second-hand experience of what life abroad is and what all they can do if they settle abroad. Then uh, this also means that uh, these films also help us in interpreting globalism in understanding globalization in a better way. Popular Hindi films borrow foreign concepts, actors and special effects mm -hmm. to attract more viewers and to create what is known as interpenetrating globalism. So today it is the world uh, is not something which is discrete or uh, which has not been explored so far. You can uh, experience it firsthand in front or in uh, through the screen and the three hours that you are spending in the cinema hall can definitely give you that wetted experience. The term interpenetration can be defined as a complex web of narrative production and structure where Indian filmmakers make film about the lives of Indians living abroad. So basically diaspora has continued to have a very important influence on the themes of films that have been uh, uh, being made post 1990s. Now during the 1990s, Hindi films demonstrated a common identity by creating an ideology that was fascinating for Indians across the globe and not only for India. Now coming to the issue of Indian diaspora. Bollywood cinema plays a very important part in shaping the cultural aspect of Indian diaspora and vice versa. 
So in fact, both diaspora as well as uh, the Indian cinema have an impact on each other and they draw upon each other for various experiences. Uh, the Indian population is definitely growing in a big way in various countries like US, UK, Dubai, Malaysia, etc. And it is also one of the fastest growing diasporas in the world where Indian cinema is hugely popular. Bollywood has definitely created a culture industry abroad and Hindi films have featured in the top 10 movies lists of US and uh, UK and USA as the first generation uh, NRI maintains uh, the values of uh, Indianness, community, family, arranged marriages, respect towards elders, etc. So therefore, films like uh, Hum Aapke Hai Kaun, 1994, Dilwale Dulhaniya Le Jayenge, uh, 1995, uh, were massive hits uh, in these countries as the storylines revolved around second generation Indians settled in the West, but at the same time, those uh, Indians were very much rooted to the traditional values and uh, often they would come back to India uh, looking for uh, brides and eventually they would uh, emerge as more Indians than the Indians who were already living here. So these kind of themes became hugely popular abroad and they were experimented in a number of films. Now, uh, uh, the whole idea of globalization is also linked to the idea of entertainment as to how, make, how to make films that are instantly uh, popular among masses also. And it is in this context that one has to discuss the issue of item numbers. Again, a trend that started in post-1990s films. So songs and dances are the major highlights of popular uh, Bollywood cinema as they convey interesting expressions, emotions and desires uh, and many times these are not even called for but they are uh, deliberately uh, fixed in the film. These item numbers have any relation to the actual storyline of the film but uh, in order to show uh, erotic dance moves and scantily dressed women uh, dancing in pubs or discos, uh, they have become an essential flavor of the movie makers. Therefore, uh, such dancers who are known as item girls comprise an important part of industry and it is not as if uh, uh, all the item girls belong to the gender of unknown actors. Uh, many well-known uh, and established uh, heroines and actresses have also played uh, actively the role of item girls and this has speedily boosted up uh, the profits that the films have generated. Now some item numbers have been shot on white female dancers for authenticity uh, and American hip hop uh, pop music, salsa and Britney Spears video one more time has definitely gone a long way in inspiring these item numbers. Item numbers are, have been created uh, not only to titillate the desires among the audiences but also to cater to the excessive voyeuristic sexuality as has been remarked by Pendakur in 2003. Therefore, the theory of globalization conceptualizes the employment of new techniques in the cinema and treatment of women just to fit the men's ideas of entertainment. So therefore, globalization has not really resulted in a modernization uh, and a, a change in the social values as far as the art of filmmaking is concerned. Rather, there has been a regressive trend of replicating what was continuing in the past that is enjoying uh, the voyeuristic pleasure while watching women dance on screen and now this has been done with greater elan 
and greater commitment by the filmmakers. Now, next th essential uh, discussion that can also be related to globalization uh, theorization is hybridity as to how hybridity has influenced uh, Indian cinema. And uh, this study was conducted by Gillespie in 1990, where she situates the culture of the Indian diaspora in the framework of hybridity. This hybridity is definitely uh, rooted in Indian values as well as Western thoughts and practices. So hybridity theorizes itself as a product where new techniques of production in the consumption of films and music are encouraged. So the entire ethos of Indianness or deep-rooted uh, Indian cultural values have to be compromised with the Western tendencies. Hybridity of both the cultures that is East and West has created music and films that have successfully catered to the orthodox and the contemporary needs of the viewers. Now we come to the fourth theory uh, related to uh, cinema and that is the theory of popular culture. The gratification of men is an instant hit as far as one talks about uh, filmmakers and uh, making the kind of films that are popular among the audiences. So even in the Indian context, popular culture is influenced by dominant culture and the popular culture caters to the needs of the masses while creating an influence on them in turn. So here again, it's a two-way process and popular culture's emphasis on hierarchy, male dominance and patriarchy is clearly reflected in Indian films. And this trend also has not really been uh, completely transformed post-1990s uh, uh, globalization. And the mo uh, most of the commercial cinema has portrayed the heroes as an ideal man uh, uh, at social, familial and uh, official levels, uh, someone like who is a perfectionist and who rarely goes wrong. Whereas uh, women are definitely not projected in these kind of unrealistic portrayals. Now besides this, uh, 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 men are also portrayed as extremely uh, uh, responsible, uh, nationalist and protective towards their spouses uh, and also elders, thereby conforming to the popular culture ideals that are rooted in Indian domesticity. So Indianness for men is being brave, responsible and offering protection, whereas for women it means being sexually pure, obedient, subservient and being extremely devoted to the family. And this cannot be compromised even when the world is changing. So Bollywood films uh, have always upheld dominant values of society which in turn can be described as part of the popular culture and they have been barely challenged though uh, in recent times there have been films who have picked up these non-conventional themes which I would be discussing in the future course of the lecture. Now coming to the themes of popular culture, one example that one can talk about is uh, Karva Chauth that has been transformed into a universal festival on screen in post-globalization films, especially for example films like Dilwale Dulhaniya Le Jayenge that came out in 1995. So thereby this trend has resulted in opening up of the market for the new cultural commodities. And also it has resulted in another very undesirable practice and that is homogenization of tastes and preferences. So therefore it is considered as but natural that all women uh, living in India must observe Karva Chauth, they must be observing Karva Chauth and they must be taking pride in doing so as it is part of the great the so, uh, the so called great cultural heritage and also has been made as part of the popular culture. Then uh, the fifth theory that I would like to discuss in terms of uh, filmmaking uh, is the theory of hegemony that was developed by 
Antonio Gramsci. Uh, the concept uh, was developed uh, in post-1998 uh, in terms of cinema. Uh, and uh, talking about the concept of hegemony, it basically deals with the concept of dominance and influence of patriarchy and how this has affected the society and most of our Bollywood films are based on this ideology. So even if the storyline is slightly different, the end would ultimately result in triumph of patriarchy. And this hegemony, hegemonic ideology has also endorsed religion and it has tried to make religion more powerful, internalized and also devised a common ideology for Indian society, which again is not the reality of a multicultural, multilingual, uh, you know, uh, society that India represents. So the entire uh, beauty of the composite culture uh, might get uh, compromised with these kind of tendencies being encouraged by Indian cinema. Now coming to the themes of popular culture that have been uh, uh, utilized time and again and coming to the themes of religion uh, that again has not been compromised. Uh, religion has continued to pervade popular culture for example the epics and mythological tales of Hinduism uh, have always celebrated male dominance and this theme has continuously been adopted by the filmmakers. This also explains as to why women centered films in which women are shown as self-dependent and responsible uh, uh, and uh, offbeat have stirred controversy time and again an aspect that was discussed in the last lecture in detail when we discussed the films made by Deepa Mehta. Now instead of, instead of adhering to the usual patriarchal framework, these movies uh, must challenge the stereotypical portrayal and only then one can talk of true globalization or true modernization as having dawned. Now, uh, the next part of the lecture would uh, deal with the new kind of films and the new kind of themes that have been adopted by the filmmakers. So, it is in this uh, context that I would be raising the issue of sisterhood. So far, movies have been made about men, men helping men, you know, brothers coming together uh, after uh, getting lost and how the whole family was united. But really, there has been attempt to understand journey of women and how women help each other and how the issue of women's agency can be beautifully portrayed on screen by showing a different level of camaraderie, different level of friendship and also sisterly. Uh, behavior, uh, not only essentially of uh, sisters who are sisters by blood, but also due to common ideology or, or also due to their uh, urge to help fellow women. So it is in this context that a sister's role in the film, that is a woman's role in the film, uh, not as a stereotypical uh, damsel in distress, but as someone who has as noble aspects attached to her character as a hero must be discussed in greater detail. Sisters in Hindi mu movies are also a rarity. Uh, they are a rare commodity unless they are sisters to a brother. And But now since the times are changing, uh, sisters function as a safety net in the chaotic world and there are many movies which show this sisterly bond and they have tried, uh, uh, these kind of movies have also tried to challenge the stereotypes. Uh, uh, and when we come to Bollywood, there are very few movies that can explore the relationship between sisters or they can explore the relationship between women. Many movies on the bonds between brother and sister or between two brothers or the spirit of brotherhood have been made time and again. But one can count on fingers the movies that have been made with women uh, in the background. Uh, very few movies celebrate the crucial bond in a woman's life. 
thereby displaying again elements of deep rooted elements of patriarchy and male chauvinism which not only plague indian society but also indian film industry most sisters in hindi movies are characters who need protection uh, who need some kind of uh, a savior as they are molested or raped by evil social elements and eventually it is the male member uh, mostly a brother who avenges her the wrong that has been done to her but again as i said things are changing and a lot of movies in recent times celebrate the bonds of sisterhood uh, however even amidst this a uh, blatant male domination uh, even in older times one can talk of some such movies where bonds of sisterhood uh, childhood sisterhood were celebrated now one such example uh, of uh, women agency and how women uh, played a very important role in helping other wo- uh, women can be given in a film like mirch masala uh, which was a smita patel starer uh, it was the story of a beautiful and a uh, very attractive confident woman sown by whose hud- husband is away from the village uh, for work and one of the tax collectors uh, Uh, tried to physically abuse her and is slapped by her so she uh, flees uh, and she tries to hide herself in a spice factory in order to save herself now it's beautifully de- depicted in the movie as to how the entire village led by the mayor comes and demands the door of the factory to be opened to uh, let the rape of son by happen but the group of women who uh, women workers who were working inside the factory with the help of the guard and the village teacher refused to do that and they help son by to face the situation and as the very title of the film suggests these women had a very novel idea they were grounding chilies and they just threw uh, the whole uh, you know a sheet full of chili chili powder uh, in into the eyes of that evil person which was uh, the role played by nasiruddin shah so therefore uh, showing that how a lone woman could not have won this battle but how the entire bunch of women when they rallied around son bai the battle could be easily won then uh, another movie that one can talk about is chalbaz the sri uh, sri devi starer uh, which was definitely a remake of the older sita or geeta uh, in which manju emerges as the stronger sister and anju as uh, a, a, a meek and a coy sister but both the sisters definitely influence each other's personality uh, hugely and uh, ultimately celebrated the sisterly bond uh then it is in this background that one can also talk about movies made by gurinder chadda in gurinder chadda's bride and prejudice which is inspired by jane austen's pride and prejudice uh it displays the character of bakshi's sisters uh and the, uh, the entire dynamics Uh, is beautifully portrayed on the screen uh, it has been uh, portrayed as to how the sisters are so very different from each other but still they display close bonds now uh, having discussed uh, these various kind of movies i would put a stop to the discussion right now and in the future course of our discussion we would discuss some more movies and then we would also be discussing as to how women have been portrayed in the media thanks
welcome back. Uh, we were discussing how uh, some movies have picked up the issue of sisterhood and they have moved beyond the role played by men uh, in uh, cinema and they have given sufficient space to women. Now, uh, it is in this context that I can give you a number of examples of movies like Fashion, Door, Chak De, Bol, Khub Surat, Gulab Gang, Begum Jaan, English, English Pinglish, No One Killed, Jessica, etc. So, whenever it is possible, uh, all those who are interested in uh, this topic, they must take out time and watch these movies and you will yourself realize as to how differently the theme of uh, femininity uh, uh, and domesticity has been uh, explained in these movies, uh, not with a traditional portrayal of women, but uh, with an offbeat kind of a portrayal. But at the same time, the, the roles are very much rooted in Indianness. So it is not a blatant uh, impact of globalization or westernization or hybridization that these kind of films project. But at the same time, they have given so much space to women, not only to come up with uh, excellent performances, but also beautiful storyline and very good direction indeed. Uh, now coming to more recent times, one can talk about Kangana Ranaut starer Queen, which many of you must have watched, where the relationship between two culturally different women has been uh, depicted on screen uh, in a very heart touching and a very funny way. So while Kan Kangana is shocked watching Lisa Hayden's character, her liaisons with a different men, uh, her relationships that keep on changing every night, and but still Kangana develops a liking for her, uh, though she herself continues to believe in the traditional values attached to marriage. Uh, Lisa, on the other hand, shows Kangana a life that she has never seen before. Uh, she takes them to pubs where they dance, party all night together without worrying uh, about what is the world going to think. So thereby, both these women have an influence on each other. Then another example that can be uh, given uh, is uh, uh, another recent movie, uh, The Angry Indian Goddesses. Uh, which is the story of four friends who come over for another friend's baccalaureate party at her house in uh, Goa. And what transpires between these women and how they deal with the challenges uh, is uh, quite different and uh, quite engrossing. Uh, then another movie, Lipstick Under My Burqa, uh, again depicts the solidarity uh, that the women show towards one another. So instead of portraying women as always backstabbing and not helping uh, uh, each other in times of distress, this is a more realistic uh, and a more convincing portrayal. And the scene where Shireen helps Buaji in buying a swimming costume uh, is quite interesting. And also the scene where Leela and Shireen share a moment of helplessness about their respective lives. But when they discuss with each other, it gives them great solace which they have not experienced earlier. And the last scene where the women share their laughter and tears are some of the poignant moments which de definitely show uh, the kind acts and the gentle acts of sisterhood which have been beautifully and meaningfully portrayed. So, uh, in conclusion, one can say that so much has been discussed as far as uh, Indian cinema is concerned and the various ups and downs and changes and transformation that it has gone through. Uh, so, one can say that while we do have very good male directors and uh, uh, actors who have done full justice to the art of filmmaking, it is women directors who are quite sensitive and brave in their portrayal of women characters and issues. And many women directors have portrayed their characters without making them a subject to sympathy. So therefore, women are not seen as a subject of sympathy, but as someone who takes things in her hand and exercises women's agency. And this is in stark contrast 
to the kind of films made by the male directors who are always projecting women as someone who needs help, particularly from the male members of society. So a stronger desire to fight for justice emerges in uh, this new wave uh, cinema, particularly one made by the women directors. And despite going through a lot of challenges and opposition during the filming process, uh, women directors were not discouraged and rather they finished these films and also won various records. Now, uh, uh, with this, uh, we end our uh, discussion on cinema, but now we move on to our very next uh, and a very important piece of discussion, and that is portrayal of women in the media. Now, while discussing this, first of all, let us discuss as to what constitutes media. So, in media, uh, one can take into consideration different kinds like the print media that would include uh, newspapers, the journals, magazines, you know, fashion magazines, uh, all the printed material that you can talk of. And then in electronic media, you all know the visual medium where you can uh, take into consideration the television, uh, even cinema can be included in this again. And then also advertisements, then one can talk of radio, etc., internet. So, uh, with these different kind of availability of media, uh, what we are going to discuss today uh, is to how women have been portrayed, not only in advertisements, but also in various uh, TV shows, the soap operas, various programs, news, etc., Various advertisements and pictures in magazines convey messages about cultural norms, beliefs, practices and also norms of gendered relations for both men and women. Also an increasing presence of female body as well as the eroticized male body uh, has implicit notions of power and privileges that are again deep rooted in patriarchy. Media has definitely emerged as a socialization tool with time and uh, uh, th uh, there has been a capitalization of media and the profit motive has definitely been on the rise. Now, the overall process of mediaization of uh, the entire society has impacted an individual's mind. So therefore, gender is produced and reproduced through media reinforcing traditional values because as was found by the research of various scholars, media has definitely not challenged the existing stereotypes, rather it has reinforced. So therefore, I say that there has been a reproduction of traditional stereotypes and patriarchy. Uh, uh, um, Laura Mulvey has made a, a, a brief description of how media needs to be challenged and she has conceived the term the male gaze. The male gaze definitely refers to the way men want to see women on screen or the way men want to to see women in various kind of media projections. So therefore, there has been attempt to construct reality from a male point of view. So therefore, what women want to see on screen is rarely the subject of discussion or appreciation, but rather what would please the eyes of men is unilaterally uh, considered and reinforced time and again. Also, one can talk about gender disparity in media exposure. That is, uh, not only are fewer women than men literate, but fewer are also regularly exposed to media. So, according to the uh, data uh, generated by NFHS3 uh, for India in 2005-2006, the percentage of men and women in the age 15 to 19 years who were regularly exposed to print media, TV, radio or cinema, uh, men were 88% uh, whereas women were merely 71% thereby displaying a gender disparity of almost 19%. 
Now, uh, coming to the issue of representation of women in fashion magazines, this again is uh, a, a very lopsided uh, kind of a, a, a discussion that revolves around as to how and why women are in what ways women are depicted in these magazines. Fashion magazines are not for all women in a society. The target women generally belongs to the upper middle class and the rich. And uh, in most of these fashion magazines, the subject of discussion is eventually beauty, fashion, style, uh, grooming and obviously it is not female emancipation. And they do not even talk about serious issues like sexual abuse, empowerment, economic exploitation or domestic exploitation, etc. Uh, mostly the uh, focus is on uh, the shape of the figure, various therapies like yoga or uh, pilates or such exercises to uh, give a better uh, image to the body, the use of cosmetics, dating and sex. And the way these fashion magazines are becoming popular, they are now not only targeting the middle and the upper middle class or the higher class, but also the lower middle class by bringing about cheaper versions of such fashion magazines, thereby targeting a much wider group which is settled not only in metropolitan cities, but also in towns and probably in rural areas also. The fashion magazines are not concerned about the unity of women as such and irrespective of the color, creed and race, their unilateral emphasis on selecting models on the basis of the fair skin is again a kind of glaring anomaly. And in a study conducted on the cover page appearances in print media, fashion magazines in 2014, it was found out that the tilt, the preference was more towards the white skin than any other skin type. And a total of 600 cover pages from 44 major fashion magazines that were stu studied uh, over a period of time, it was found out that uh, as many as 576 times it was the white models who were depicted and only 119 times the colored models were depicted. So thereby, these fa fashion magazines are not only uh, encouraging gender disparity by projecting women in particular uh, ways and uh, uh, mediums, but they are also encouraging racial disparity and this racial division is particularly glaring as you look at the cover pages of these fashion magazines. Now one can give an example of how the whole trend started with the fashion magazine Vogue which was started in 1892 when Arthur Turner founded Vogue in the New York City. And the idea was to create a new aristocracy like the one that existed in Europe among the women in U USA and to make women in USA more fashion savvy, more upworldly mobile, uh, you know, just like their counterparts in European countries. And uh, soon the trend started uh, and a number of uh, fashion magazines appeared and in India there are a number of fashion magazines like Savvy, Harper's, Bazaar, then New Woman, Verve, Cosmopolitan, Marie Claire, Women's Era, LA, Femina, etc. And surprisingly even uh, some uh, non-fashion magazines also include a number of advertisements that are not really pertaining to uh, a common theme and uh, project women in particular ways. Now uh, considering how there has been a historical trajectory and what were the past projections of women in media which has resulted in creation of a particular kind of image of women, one can talk about 1920s when the Victorian hourglass figure gave way to the pencil thin f image of women and it was now uh, increasingly promoted that women should have this kind of pencil thin figure and by 1950s a thin woman with large breast was seen as most desirable. So therefore, media definitely played a very important role in creating the desirability 
for a kind of body type and the race started among women to acquire that kind of body type uh, in no time. Coming to 1960s, by 1960s it was slenderness rather than roundness which became the single most indicator of physical attractiveness following the arrival of British supermodel Twiggy. Uh, then uh, the trend was continued with the Playboy magazine which again promoted the slim body type as the ideal mm -hmm. between 18, 1958 to 1979. Now coming to 1970 uh, mm -hmm. to 1980, uh, okay, uh, excuse me, there is a question I think. Yeah. Hello. Hello ma'am. Hanji, please mention your name. Uh, hello ma'am, my name is Pawan Giri. Hello Pawan. And I am Varanasi. Hello Pawan. Ha. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Mm -hmm. I have a question, ma'am. Can I ask? Hanji, you may ask your question, Pavan. Uh, ma'am. My question is, in cinema, women are portrayed very wrongly and vulgarly. They are drinking liquor, smoking. Madam, how we can stop it and uh, what is the rule and regulation on it? Okay, uh, okay. Pavan. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to ask you as to why uh, vulgarity uh, is associated with women only. If you are talking about women are sh shown as smoking and drinking on screen, then the, the same rule applies to men also. Okay, We are living in times of gender equality where we are trying to achieve gender equality. So this kind of an idea that women should not be depicted on screen smoking or drinking should also apply to uh, you know, men also. So that should be the question rather than why women are depicted. I hope, Pavan, your query might have been uh, answered well. Okay, ma'am. May, we may uh, continue with yeah, the lecture, okay. ma'am. Uh, I think uh, that should uh, uh, this, though it calls for. Um, greater discussion so that I can clarify the doubts uh, this young man has but since I have to continue and uh, keep up the tempo of the lecture I would uh, pick up that issue some other time. Now uh, we were discussing as to uh, what was the historical trajectory and how from 1920s to 1930s and 1960s there has been a change in the way the body image of women has undergone transformation, the way media wants to see it and the same uh, has been adopted by women also. So they are con constantly working and reworking on their uh, uh, figure and trying to uh, try to satisfy uh, the expectations of the media moguls. So by 1970 and 1980s, there was an overall increased emphasis on weight loss and the body shape in the context of popular women's magazines such as Cosmopolitan and Vogue. Uh, Vogue. Now by 1990s, the ideal body type for women was slight and slender but with a more athletic and toned look and uh, uh, Naomi Wolf in uh, 1991 in her book The Beauty Myth uh, says that how images of ultra thin supermodels and the perfect bodies that were glamorized by advertising, fashion, etc. are basically patriarchal attacks on women's bodies. So thereby again one can talk about the male gaze here. So the way a male gets satisfaction looking at a woman's body, the similar kind of body a woman must aspire for herself and the cause is definitely carried forward by the media through these various fashion magazines and the kind of portrayals that are depicted on the pages of the fashion magazines. Then another interesting study is that undertaken by Jean Kilburn uh, uh, who says that advertising creates a mythical and a mostly white world in which people are not at all ugly or overweight uh, they are not poor, they are not struggling or disabled uh, physically or mentally. So everyone is perfect 
beauty, uh, beautiful uh, and they are visually so appealing. Therefore, uh, the kind of images that uh, are conveyed is that of perfection and no imperfections can be allowed. And in order to become a perfect, the whole industry has come up which deals with plastic surgeries, with uh, laser uh, hair removals and what not. Then various scientific studies and the most uh, casual viewing yield the same conclusion. The conclusion is that women are shown as beautiful, as housewives and as sex objects. And many women rather internalize these stereotypes and themselves uh, try to limit their possibilities of remaining natural and the way they are born. And some disturbing statistics that have emerged over a period of time, uh, the average weight of a model is almost 23% lower than that of an average woman. And uh, 20 years ago, the difference was 8%. So you can see that uh, as there is so much pressure on women to maintain their hourglass figure and they, they are definitely compromising on their health in a big way. There is now uh, almost uh, uh, 33 billion uh, US dollars uh, diet industry that was non-existent 20 years ago. And the onus for this definitely goes to the media projections of perfect women figures. Then in the last 25 years, there has been a 60% increase in females shown purely as decorative or sex objects in various magazines, not only to talk of fashion magazines. The body type portrayed in advertising as the ideal is naturally possessed by only 2 to 5 percent of females. So rest of the females are constantly under pressure to achieve that perfect body type. And in a recent survey by Teen People magazine, 27 percent of the girls felt that the media pressures uh, uh, on them uh, were so much that they were only aspiring to have a perfect body and nothing else, nothing less. 69% of the girls in one study said that magazine models influence their idea of perfect body shape. So therefore, uh, looking at these statistics, you can realize the potentialities that media has for impacting a woman's psyche, a, so, a, a, a society's psyche. Now, what all this uh, trend of having perfect body type resulted in? This has resulted in a very dangerous trend of eating disorders and a creation of a negative body image, which again plagues women primarily. Uh, this has resulted in a number of disorders like anorexia, uh, where people starve themselves and they start suffering from eating disorder after that. Then bulimia nervosa, where people consume large amounts of food and then rid their bodies of excess uh, calories by vomiting. And uh, they consume large quantities of laxatives to reach the ideal weight. Then it is binge eating disorder, an illness that resembles bulimia. And the, uh, the disorder uh, leads to episodes of uncontrolled eating or binge eating when the body is no longer able to starve itself. And eating disorders sadly have increased by 400% since 1970. So you can see how uh, globalization, liberalization has further hastened this process, uh, enhanced this uh, uh, culture of eating disorder and keeping oneself starved and always on diet and always on a weight loss spree in order to meet that ideal body and weight type. Now, uh, 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 interestingly, a number of television shows uh, were also going on in the West that promote the culture of plastic surgery. For example, the swan, then I want a famous face, then bridal plasty. All these uh, serials were kind of uh, documenting that how women, uh, in order to uh, achieve their ideal body weight, were doing what all funny things to themselves. Then as a result, media stereotypes have really taken off in a big way. Stereotypes act like codes 
that give audiences a quick and common understanding of a person and they usually relate to a particular class, ethnicity, race or gender and they also orient the, uh, lead to sexual orientation as well as social occupation thereby uh, showing their all pervasive tendency and particularly after the 1995 Beijing conference uh, UNESCO uh, uh, the guidelines that came about the guidelines on gender neutral language it was considered a necessity to pun, pu, put an end to this dogma that was being generated and so much uh, pressure that was being put on the female body that UNESCO had to publish these guidelines. Now the, these guidelines refer to a number of do's and don'ts and how media has to conduct itself. Uh, I think it is time for now and I would be continuing with uh, these media guidelines, a discussion, an objective discussion on the media guidelines in the future course of discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Ma Dr. Shruti. Thank you. Um, we all got the insight into the media uh, women and the uh, influence of media on women body and certainly we need guidelines for the kind of stereotypes being created or generated by media because obviously media has a greater influence a larger influence on mass so today that was it for the live lecture if you have any feedbacks or suggestion you can write into us at info.cac at nic.in uh, this is it for today's lecture thank you